स्टार्ट हेलो एवरीवन थैंक यू अलकुम आदाब नमस्ते एंड टुडे इज अ वेरी डिफरेंट टॉपिक शेक्सपियर स्टडीज एट अलीगढ़ मुस्लिम यूनिवर्सिटी एंड द स्पीकर इज प्रोफेसर आसिम सिद्दीकी प्रोफेसर एंड चेयरमैन एट द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश एट अलीगढ़ मुस्लिम यूनिवर्सिटी और द इंट्रोडक्टिव स्पीकर इज प्रोफेसर मुनीरा फ्रॉम द सेम डिपार्टमेंट and the concluding remarks will be given by our professor anis rahman sahab uh, who, who is a very uh, well known figure here on this uh, diaspora as well as asim sahab uh, anis sahab is uh, was the professor and head of uh, english department at jamia millia islamia he is a well known critic uh, of english and urdu poetry uh, so is the professor asim siddiqui sahab also welcome to all and now over to professor munira uh, who will be do, doing the doing the introductory remarks welcome you all thank you uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen from across the ocean and good evening to all our friends on this side wish you a very happy new year today we are going to hear professor asim siddiqui speak about shakespeare studies at aligarh muslim university Shakespeare has been a part of our syllabi since the establishment of the Department of English here. We have had excellent scholars and teachers like Professor Mukbul Hasan, Professor Asloob Ansari, Professor Ifrat Ara, to name a few. Professor Asim Siddiqui will give you more details. I would like to add a slightly different um, angle here: drama in performance. was shakespeare's forte and ours was never an affair never a love closet affair with shakespeare we had uh, an open affair with him um beyond studying shakespeare we performed shakespeare we had on stage an open air performances of his plays at the drama club and at women's college where both students and teachers were part of the performance midsummer night's dream 12th night and as you like it were all performed with resounding success this was because of the love instilled in us through shakespeare studies i met professor asim siddiqui 30 years ago when we were part of an american civilization course at the american studies research center at hyderabad india he was introduced to us as a bright young scholar from aligarh muslim university during our interaction what i noticed most about him was his in depth knowledge about any topic that he spoke about and also his unfailing wit i guess my connection with aligarh muslim university started here Professor Muhammad Asim Siddiqui has been a part of the Department of English at Aligarh Muslim University since 1987. Before he started his career here, he was a student of this department. He worked on the American novelist Mark Twain for his doctoral thesis. He was one of the earliest scholars who showed great interest in literary theory and criticism. He was a bright full bright fellow. at the new york university in 2007 professor siddiqui's areas of interest and publications include south asian literature literary theory 19th and 20th century english and american fiction south asian literature film studies and research methods in the humanities professor siddiqui regularly contributes re uh, research articles and book reviews to journals and books he has been writing prolifically on arts and culture for different newspapers magazines and news portals they include the guardian the hindu hindustan times the statesman ndtv frontline india today magazine cafe de sensus the book review biblio readup.com scroll.in and the list goes on his most recent books are a monograph on shahryar published by sahitya academy in the makers of indian literature series and a co-authored book a history 
of Aligarh Muslim University from 1920 to 2020, published by Bennett and Coleman in 2021. Professor Siddiqui also translates from Urdu and Hindi into English. His recent translations include four chapters on Joginder Paul. In Joginder Paul, a writerly writer by Rutledge, three chapters in Joginder Paul Reader, and a monograph on Puratul and Heather, both published by Sahitya Academy. He is the managing editor of the Urdu translation of the complete works of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, a Government of India project of Dr. Ambedkar Foundation by the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. Many of us have been a part of a fortnightly webcast hosted by him on English books on Urdu language and literature for Anjuman Tarakki Urdu Him. It is always a pleasure to hear Professor Siddiqui speak as he can speak on any given topic with flair. This is because of his extensive reading on various subjects and his love for language and literature. Professor Siddiqui is much loved by both his colleagues and his students. He is currently the chairman of the Department of English and students feel most comfortable talking, talking to him and expressing their ideas and concerns. He always motivates his students and never uses disparaging words. This is the opinion that most students have about him. During COVID, he con conducted online classes and most students attended his class with rapt attention. Professor Asim Siddiqui is most suited to speak on this topic because he has the advantage of a long association with Aligarh Muslim University and also because he has heard about the other stalwarts of this department from his teachers and his senior colleagues as well. Let us now hear Professor Muhammad Asim Siddiqui speak. <clears throat> Thank you, Minera for a very, very generous introduction. And I'll just pick up the last sentence that Munira spoke. And that sentence was that I have seen. Well, I ask you whether my voice is My voice Break hora aapka video or voice. Is my voice coming clearly? Your voice and video both are breaking like, you know, this. You need to speak a little yeah, more loudly. Yeah, yeah. It's not maybe. A different source. Just one minute. Try there now. is some problem. It's not really no. Try it's working. It is not a smooth. It is not coming well. Asim, sir, your voice is breaking and your video is also flickering in between. We are not able to see you clearly or hear you clearly. I think he will rejoin. There is some issues that, yeah, he's. Okay. Let's wait one. Yeah. Well, we should have checked earlier how is this status. Anyway. Uh, so, Dr. Monira, maybe continue the introductory part or maybe extend it to Shakespeare, whatever you can, you know, until he comes back. Uh, we could continue. Actually, um, usually there's no problem with sir's uh, audio and video. I don't know why it's playing up. Sometimes we do have internet issues here uh, at Aligarh. 
so maybe that's why it's playing up i have known uh, professor asim siddiqui for more than 30 years i met him in 1993 so 2023 today is 30 years and over this whole period my association with him as a friend and then as a colleague has been amazing i have learned so much from him in terms of uh, um reading literature in terms of teaching literature and in terms of handling classroom teaching so uh, what else can i add to this uh, is when i talk about his his interest in film studies i mean any film over the past 50 years we've had so many films you talk about any film and he is an encyc- encyclopedia he can talk about it so well he knows dialogues from so i mean great dialogues from so many movies he knows who is the director who is who has made this movie what are the special features about a particular movie he can talk on and on and on it's not just film studies any topic for that matter can talk about the sports also the same yeah, way yes yes about cricket you you should just sit and hear him speak yeah, this sports uh, exactly so it's amazing uh, being his colleague and a friend and uh, i was really honored when i was asked to introduce him because i have so much to say about him and then they told me that i have only 5 minutes and now somehow uh, i've had 2 3 minutes extra well that's okay you know he is still not here so uh, is some serious issue mm <laughs> i think it, he must be switching over to his mobile data from the wifi and then that's why it must take a minute or two and he'll join us anisha yes please yes anira why don't you call him just i'll do him. that sir i yeah. shall do that this up just uh, engage people with some something is it's Friends, just... people don't talk of shakespeare these days as much as we used to when we were students yeah uh, <laughs> the reason is that uh, the canon of english studies has expanded uh, beyond expectation during the past 3 or 4 decades so as a result new areas of studies have emerged and we have been trying to accommodate and trying to understand what's all happening on the academic front all over the world not only in india everywhere else but all said and done shakespeare remains the major part of the canon he occupies a prominent position not only in the english language but people from different languages also have studied shakespeare let me put this light off first so that we can <clears throat> so people from all over in different languages and a very interesting aspect of it is that there is so much of shakespeare available in translation and it has been staged accordingly so it has uh, sent waves across and people have been able to relate with shakespeare wherever they have been and they are so that is the magic of shakespeare and shakespeare and studies that is happening for the past especially in indian universities uh, there has been a trend that uh, <clears throat> Uh, new areas of course are coming up it has become very difficult to accommodate new areas and new 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 domains of knowledge that have come up during the past three decades especially but in spite of all and all said and done shakespeare remains a part of the syllabi uh, all over the country and it starts from the graduation to post graduation and also goes on to the mphil and the phd level so lots of his students are of course graduating and of course trying to take their degrees in shakespeare studies But apart from that, there are many universities which have very special libraries about Shakespeare. Works on and by Shakespeare, dramaturgy studies in Shakespeare, taking into consideration how they are, they should be staged and how the students have trained themselves. When we taught, there were lots of students who took interest in Shakespeare and studied Shakespeare not only in the classroom, but outside they <clears throat> performed Shakespeare and they trained themselves as actors. so we have had students in our universities who emerged actually as actors of shakespeare's plays and finally they adopted it as a career finally and uh, that really became the source of bread and butter for them so shakespeare works in too many ways not only in the text 
not only in the classroom, but outside the classroom. So the impact of Shakespeare has been, what do you say, Manira? What is your opinion? How do you do? How do you negotiate with Shakespeare in your university? How is it going on? I understand there are colleagues from the Department I, of English in Arigad uh, also. I think he is here. Paisal, aage hai make him. Paisal. Ah. Paisal? G, I made them. Made him. Yeah, please. Uh, Asim sir. Sorry, any sir. Uh, somehow. How are you, Asim sir? Hi, he's back. He's back. I'm sorry. <laughs> you are yeah. audible now, Asim sir. Please start now. It's okay. Yeah. I'm sorry for this interruption, but uh, it was not in my control. Okay. okay. Uh, so I pick up from the last sentence actually, which Munira spoke, that uh, I have seen many important stalwarts actually who talked about Shakespeare, discussed Shakespeare, and uh, I have also read little bit about them and also read little bit their own work, and of course I have heard them also. Since we are talking about uh, Shakespeare and uh, and Shakespeare at Aligarh Muslim University. Just uh, a few remarks about the importance of Shakespeare probably will help to place Shakespeare in context. We know that uh, Shakespeare was probably the most important uh, Elizabethan playwright. But in his own time, Shakespeare was just like other playwrights maybe a bit superior to others, maybe a bit more resourceful, but in his own time, he did not have the kind of status actually that uh, we associate Shakespeare with. And in fact, uh, soon after his death, uh, a particular folio edition of Shakespeare came out. And uh, when a folio edition comes out, it means that that person is important, that that uh, that person is important and that uh, playwright is important because folio edition is similar to a kind of a coffee table book, which is expensive also. And of course, uh, but we see that uh, gradually Shakespeare was becoming more and more important. And in the 18th century, we see that uh, a particular process started where we see that Shakespeare was being spoken in almost divine terms, that somebody who is divine, somebody who is very important. And somebody like Voltaire actually mentioned this in 18th century, that whenever Englishmen talk about Shakespeare, they almost make him appear divine. And of course, there are many institutions also which supported that. Many painters, they painted Shakespeare. And of course, later, uh, many films. And you'll, you'll see that possibly very different kinds of films and of course stage also and of course literary criticism so you see that there are different institutions at work it was uh, the theater stage paintings music later cinema and of course literary criticism for our purposes actually literary criticism is directly relevant because we are talking about uh, Shakespeare as he has been received in India. Now, another angle also must be just uh, briefly touched that uh, since India is a country which was ruled by Britain and Shakespeare is a very important icon in Britain. So when actually teaching of English started, Shakespeare also became important. So that is another very important thing. Now let us talk about uh, Aligarh Muslim University briefly. You see, when Aligarh Muslim University started its journey in 1875 from a school, and of course then in 1877, it became a college, Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College. Now at that time, already Shakespeare was a very important name, but we must also remember this fact that uh, in all colleges and universities in Britain, English was not a subject. It was not a teaching subject. The view was that since people study literature anyway, so what is the need to what is the need to include literature as a teaching subject? So that means gradually the teaching of literature was also institutionalized. 
and uh, we'll see that after first world war actually the teaching of literature will be completely institutionalized rather it it is said that it needed a massacre to convince people that literature english literature can be taught because uh, when there is war there is that feeling of nationalism and when there is that feeling of nationalism there is uh, a very strong need to connect to your own heroes to your own history not german history not any other history but rather english history and there of course shakespeare became important so shakespeare and of course along with others so that is roughly the context now when we see for example uh, 19th century and early years of amio college there we see that uh, aligarh muslim university was or rather amio college was affiliated to calcutta university and uh, later when alabad university was established aligarh was affiliated to alabad university but if we see some references for example to shakespeare for, and uh, you know that it is not easy to get all those references and uh, for some very interesting references i'll refer to david delivell's book that is aligarh's first generation now one evidence which is provided by historians is question papers that means if uh, there is an examination and there are question papers then examination papers actually expect students to know something and students are also expected to answer those questions accordingly so in mu college books of shakespeare milton Johnson, Wordsworth, they were all prescribed. Wordsworth was prescribed. Johnson was prescribed. Milton was prescribed, and of course Shakespeare was there. And there is a, a question which was asked, and the year is eighteen eighty three, and the question was, what was the leading idea in Coriolanus, and did it represent Shakespeare's political views? If we see this question, which was asked. in 1883 and the question is asked about the play coriolanus now i have not uh, if i see the scene around me i see that coriolanus is not as popular a play as possibly all other plays of shakespeare or rather four great tragedies of shakespeare or or some important comedies that means coriolanus was an important play is for discuss it was taught and the second part of this question is his political views that means we are talking about an approach to shakespeare where shakespeare's life was also considered important that means uh, his biography was also considered important that means when we study a text there uh, we study a text in different ways and at that time one approach to study a text was also to read a text through a person's biography so this is one evidence of how shakespeare was uh, taught and how he was uh, received then there is uh, another uh, very interesting question and the question is that uh, and the question is evaluate different kinds of evidence for dating shakespeare's plays for dating shakespeare's plays now this is also something very important because one is never sure about the date of a particular play now a lot of work has already been done in this area but still we see that new evidence keeps coming and that's why we keep revising our opinions about shakespeare i'll just give you one reference gary taylor is a very important shakespeare editor uh, and i think just a few years ago he came to this conclusion that hamlet was written in 1603 that means if we consider hamlet hamlet's year of writing 1603 and not 1600 or 16, 1601 then many things change the play becomes a jacobian play rather than elizabethan play and one more important thing that changes is the character of fortin brass that means you see that fortin brass is a very important character in hamlet and when fortin brass actually 
come from Norway and in the last scene when Hamlet is killed, 14 brass takes over England. It is very unusual that a, a king or a prince from a different country comes and see the throne is handed over to him by everyone willingly. So there, 14 brass in that light is seen, rather 14 brass is seen in the image of King James I. King James I also came from outside and actually he was made king. So that means just two years different and it can change lots of things. So that's why when this question is asked in 1883, evaluation of different kinds of evidence for dating Shakespeare's plays. That was a very interesting question. And this question is actually also related to one very important critic, actually one very influential 19th century critic. His name was Edward Dowden. And I'll just come to uh, this part a bit later because Professor Maghbul Hassan Khan worked on Dowden and he was undoubtedly the most influential 19th century critic. So Dowden would talk about these things. Then there was another very interesting development in Aligarh at that time. And that development was the Union Club, Siddhan Union Club. You know that uh, Union Club started a culture of debates. And Sir Syed Ahmad Khan was greatly inspired by the culture of debate in Cambridge. And so when this club started, Siddhan's Union Club, it encourage a culture of debates. So there is one very interesting instance of uh, uh, Shakespeare coming into discussion there. There was a topic and the topic was division of high and low. That means people of low birth and people of high birth. What is What are your views about that? And one student actually spoke against this idea. But another student actually spoke in favor of this idea that there are people who take birth and they have superior qualities because they take birth in a different family and there are others who are not as superior in their intellect or their in imagination. And they are actually that student quoted heavily from Shakespeare. Because if you read Shakespeare, then today we also blame Shakespeare sometimes for his uh, racism. We also blame Shakespeare for possibly uh, disparaging some characters. If we see, for example, uh, many such characters, uh, for example, how Turks, how Arabs, how Blacks are represented in Shakespeare. I mean, these are all important questions in post-colonial criticism. So there you see that uh, one student is bringing up evidence from Shakespeare's plays to buttress his argument in a debate in Union Club, right? And it is, uh, we are talking about uh, 1883 or so. You see that a few years later, another very important development takes place in Aligarh. And that development is Sayyid Mahmood actually brought many Cambridge students and they join Aligarh Muslim University as faculty members. One very important name was Walter Raleigh. Walter Raleigh. Walter Raleigh joined the Department of English in 1885 and he worked here for about two years. And of course, later he went to England. And one very important distinction of Walter Raleigh is that he was the first chair of English literature at Oxford. That means English was started as a teaching subject in some colleges, in some polytechnics or women's colleges. But two great universities, Oxford and Cambridge, considered English not fit enough to be taught. So when Walter Raleigh was a point, and of course, uh, I'll, uh, uh, those who are not students of English, I must tell you, that uh, one very famous remark was, if you teach English in the classroom, what, we, what will you do? Will it be chatter about Shelley? And then, of course, uh, later when literary criticism started, literary criticism tried to make English difficult, far more complex than it was. 
and that's why you see that the subject got some kind of respectability anyway and one interesting thing is that in 1920s people were asking why should you study english and in 1930s people were asking why should you study anything else so that was uh, something very interesting but uh, i'm talking about walter really he joined the department he was here for about 2 years and of course there are other uh, cambridge uh, fellows also who were who were working in aligarh and they brought a particular kind of ambience to the campus now one very important thing about walter rally is that when he was appointed professor when he was appointed professor at uh, oxford he was appointed professor on the basis of his perform not on the basis of his promise not performance that here is somebody he will deliver i don't think any sir we have appointed anybody simply on the basis of promise that oh somebody will deliver maybe we appoint lecturers on this basis but not professors but anyway so here walter rally was appointed on the basis of his promise and i think he did deliver he wrote a very interesting book on shakespeare it was part of a series and of course he also wrote a book on milton but later you will see that uh, walter really join war campaign and he took very active part in first world war but the very fact that walter really was interested in shakespeare it also is important because uh, he contributed in a big way to shape english studies and we have a very old literary society in the department it is named after walter rally it is called walter rally literary society it also organizes debates it also organizes uh, events and poetry reading competitions and performances from shakespeare's plays and so many things now when i when we move ahead and now i'm talking about 40s and i remember professor masudul hasan sahab telling me how shakespeare was taught to him and masud sahab is was talking about 1940s he said that is his teacher and he studied from fieldan professor fieldan he said that at that time the professor was talking mostly about emendations in shakespeare emendations in shakespeare that means uh, uh, when we study shakespeare we can study shakespeare in so many different ways but there is also a history of editorial research that means if a particular word is used in shakespeare whether this word was really written by shakespeare or it was a printer's mistake or if there is a, a particular edition of shakespeare a quarto edition and then another quarto and then a folio edition are there some changes in the text in different editions or some words are deleted in same or sometimes some words can be borderized also that means uh, some uh, some editors also try to censor shakespeare and one very and there is a word they try to borderize shakespeare that means try to make shakespeare fit for family reading that is also one very interesting thing so thing is that when we talk about history of emendations we are basically talking about text how different editors have seen that text how different editors have corrected shakespeare how they unearthed the, how they unearthed interesting evidence and in a way when we see a text we are talking about the evolution of that text through its textual history that was in 40s and we know that uh, that when we read the editorial history we actually have to read a lot and we have to pay very close attention to language and language in different countries also i'll just give you one very interesting uh, aside here in 18th century there were uh, there was a big scandal also and that big scandal was that one person tried to force shakespeare's works and he tried to present those forged works as shakespeare's works and later actually 
when this forgery was detected, it was detected through just one or through the uses of just one or two words. And one such word was unromantic. And another, I'm forgetting that word, but actually different knowledgeable editors picked some words and they said this word was not used actually in Shakespeare's time or this word was not used at this time. So you see that sometimes uh, uh, a particular use of word can reveal the entire history of a particular period. So that was uh, the study of Shakespeare through different emendations. Now if we come to a later period, because after 1947, of course, uh, we had only Indian professors. And I'll pick one very important moment. And that is uh, one very important year, 1976. 1976. 1976, I'll say that it is important in two very different ways. One, Vivian Richards established himself as the best batsman in the world in England. He demolished England. And second, Professor Aslu Mehman Ansari started a journal, the Aligarh Journal of English Studies. And if we see this journal, the year is 1976. It actually devoted a lot of attention to Shakespeare. And in 30 years of its publication, there were as many as 75 articles on Shakespeare. 75 is a very large number, very large number. That means many, many volumes, actually. And the very first issue also had an article on Twelfth Night, Othello, and Henry V. So if we see that three important aspects of Shakespeare are covered, comedies, tragedies, and of course, Shakespeare's history plays. And one more important thing is that uh, Professor Aslu Mehmed Ansari was able to get articles for the journal from famous Shakespeare scholars of the time. And I can mention, for example, somebody like Wilson Knight. Wilson Knight is a very big name in Shakespeare criticism. And another very big name is Kenneth Muir. F.R. Lewis has written on lots of things, but of course, uh, so F.R. Lewis also wrote for the journal. And in fact, Kenneth Muir, who is a very famous editor of Shakespeare, he also wrote a number of books on Shakespeare. Kenneth Muir wrote regularly on Shakespeare and other writers for the journal in 1980s. I'll just refer to one very interesting article of uh, Kenneth Muir, how it gives you a lot about Shakespeare by way of interpretations. He talks about uh, lots of things. And actually, when he talks about Hamlet, he says that in his own life, he has taken seven different positions on Hamlet. In his own life, he has taken seven different positions on Hamlet. He tried to read Shakespeare through Orestes myth. He tried to read Shakespeare because of his interest in Fabian society. And since he was a Christian, so he was inspired by Christian ethics. And he tried to read Shakespeare from that angle. And then he also became interested in French existentialism. He tried to read Hamlet through this perspective. And of course, he also developed interest in his stage. So he tried to read Hamlet through its history of performance also. And then he said that I have been interested in politics. I try to read Shakespeare, Hamlet through my own politics. And of course, one very important thing that I also try to, he is saying, Kenneth Muir, that I also try to read Shakespeare through my interest in wordplay. So if we see, for example, these different perspectives on Hamlet itself, and here uh, 
when he is interacting with Professor Ansari, as he when he is interacting with Professor Maghul Hasan Khan and other very famous scholars. So we see something of that kind in especially Professor Maghul Hasan Khan's criticism. Also, I'll come to that later. But Asloop Asloop Sahab actually wrote on Shakespeare prolifically. There were some of his uh, very major interests. Of course, uh, in Urdu, he was interested in Yaqbal and Ghalib. He brought out Nardu Nazar. And uh, there was no issue of Nardu Nazar when he did not have an article on Ghalib or Yaqbal. But uh, as far as Aligarh General of Indian Studies is concerned, now here he regularly wrote reviews and articles on Shakespeare. So that is uh, about his work. But uh, what is so special about Asloop Saab's criticism? That is also important. Uh, somebody like Todorov talks about three different kinds of readings. Three different kinds of readings. He talks about one method of reading, which he calls projection. And you see that many approaches where I believe in certain theories and I try to see projection of those theories in the play. Feminism, for example, is the kind of projection or Marxism also in some ways. And then there is another method, commentary. You read something and then you offer a commentary on that. And the third method was poetics. That means there is a certain kind of poetics and we see that poetics into a work. I think the best example of that would be the work of Gerald Janet because uh, he read Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past and he tried to discover a particular kind of poetics into that and that poetics would apply to other works also. Asloop Saab's criticism is very close to commentary and it is not surprising also because uh, the, the impact of F.R. Lewis on criticism, on English criticism is immense. Somebody like Terry Gilton has said that uh, we all were Levisite without acknowledging that because we took that quite naturally that we are Levisite. And Levis actually offered a kind of commentary on works. So Asloop Saab's criticism actually bears that influence. And since Northrop Fry's work, very important monumental work, Anatomy of Criticism appeared on the scene in 1957. So I also see the influence of uh, Fry's archetypal approach on Ansari Sahib's criticism. And of course, new criticism. And here also that all teachers of literature, especially all teachers of poetry, they use new critical method because this is, a, that method is a very important pedagogical tool also. And that method can be applied to fiction also. So if I see a sloop sub criticism, I see that his uh, write-ups on Shakespeare or other others, there actually he seems inspired by Lewis, new criticism and archetypal criticism. I'll, you see, in most of his articles, he's looking for unity in that text. And then he'll pick up some key words, some key lines. For example, in Anatomy and Cleopatra, he takes up some important images. And there was also one very important method of reading, image and symbol method. So in that text, actually, he just picks up one word, melt. And he actually uh, subjects that word to a very thorough scrutiny. Similarly, when he reads Tempest, he picks up three very important words, dream, wonder, and sleep, and talks about that. And of course, you see that from 60s onwards, Indian academia was also greatly inspired by existentialist thought. And I see a slew of, of all trends, actually, existentialist strain is most obvious in a slew of readings. And uh, it is not a kind of imposition of existentialist thought on Shakespeare's plays, but rather seeking some kinds of analogies that means there is a, a particular kind of strain in existentialism and how that strain is available in a play of Shakespeare also. For example, when he reads Measure for Measure, 
he talks about loneliness he talks about absence of communication in major repair and then different attitudes to death especially when one talks about the character of angelo in major for major similarly when he reads merchant of venice he reads merchant of venice as an existentialist comedy and hamlet is read as an existentialist tragedy one very important word in existentialist uh, theory the sign the sign uh, this is uh, uh, it's i think its meaning is being so asloop sahab picks up this word the sign and he tries to see hamlet through this perspective and of course one other method that he uses is seeing symbolic patterns in place what i also find interesting about his work is that uh, i don't see any tentativeness in his criticism that mean when he puts forward an opinion he puts forward that opinion very categorically it is a quality as well as a weakness i'll just read one sentence when he writes about tempest to regard the tempest as primarily a romance amounts to an exaggeration of a half truth only very categorical statement in fact later somebody like makbul sahab feels and i also felt this way that uh, asloop sahab appears to validate one meaning or if not validate one single meaning at least he privileges one single meaning at the expense of other meanings but anyway uh, that is uh, the quality of kirtsum and one very important thing about professor ansari is that entire canon of shakespeare all his plays all his sonnets the entire corpus of shakespeare kirtsum actually becomes his frame of reference and anisha is here and sir will uh, agree with me that these days it is not possible for many of us to read even four or five plays of shakespeare so for a scholar who has read the entire canon and actually it is not simply read he has written on almost all plays of shakespeare that is a remarkable thing and of course the entire uh, canon of kirtsum also so that means it just suggests a particular range of his scholarship and also depth of his scholarship and if i can say that uh, in asloop sahab's criticism you will see that uh, there is a focus on language there is focus on uh, motifs on symbols and the influence of new criticism f r lewis existentialist thought and of course archetypal criticism and these were the important trends uh, i know um, asloop sahab actually was not writing in 90s and from 90s onward different trends also appeared but asloop sahab was not con- uh, asloop sahab was not aware of those trends and of course he it's not needed that he should have been because he had stopped writing by that time so one question is whether his criticism is dated and i would say that it is not dated because uh, if a new kid on the block appears it does not mean that older batsmen become irrelevant it means that uh, older criticism also has value now asloop sahab not simply wrote on shakespeare himself rather he also groomed i'll say a galaxy of scholars when i was a student in uh, 1984 at that time i had the, i had this feeling that almost everyone was a shakespeare scholar almost all my teachers and that is remarkable but uh, two names i'll mention uh, one is professor uh, zahur usmani a remarkable scholar and of course the other person is professor maqbul hasan khan maqbul sahab was a brilliant teacher he was a, a brilliant scholar and of course he had tremendous clarity so if we see asloop sahab's work 
first thing is that uh, he worked on Dowden. Dowden was a very important uh, 19th century critic. And uh, what is special about Dowden is that Dowden emphasized the chronological study of Shakespeare's plays. And he also tried to establish a chronology of Shakespeare's plays in 19th century. And after that, actually, it has been challenged many times. And the second thing is, Dowden also tried to see a maturity of thought in Shakespeare through his reading of Shakespeare's plays. Makbul Sahib has written on Dowden. But Makbul Sahib uh, has also written on some other important Shakespeare critics. That means uh, when he talks about Dowden's bi biographical approach, he also talks about A.C. Bradley and especially Bradley's philosophically coherent character studies. Now, one charge against Bradley is that when you read A.C. Bradley, you will feel that he is talking about uh, people who do not exist in place, but rather who are real like figures, real like figures. And that is actually a quality of Bradley also that when you read him, and I'm just uh, telling you one very interesting uh, joke also here. Uh, it is said that once Shakespeare appeared for an examination and the paper was on Shakespeare himself. Shakespeare failed miserably in that paper. And the reason was that he had not read A.C. Bradley. So A.C. Bradley was essential reading for everyone. So because Shakespeare did not read A.C. Bradley, so Shakespeare also failed in the examination. Anyway, so Bradley has written and uh, his character studies are philosophically very coherent. Mahbul Sahib has written about that. Walter really, Walter really humanized Shakespeare. Humanized Shakespeare. That means uh, all his characters appear very human-like figures. And that way he's very close to Bradley. But Mahbul Sahib has also written quite a bit on E. E. Stoll's historical perspective. E. E. Stoll was a very important critic who actually talked about Shakespeare through the history of stage. That means he is not like a regular historical critic who is placing a work in its context, but rather he is a critic who places a work in the history of its performances. Stage conventions, because there are different stage conventions. At different times, there are different kinds of conventions. And of course, he's also able to give his asides on many other critics, L.C. Knight, for example, or uh, Derek Traversy. He called them poetic critics. I'll see that one very interesting thing about Mahbul Saab is that he kept pace with changes actually which were happening. And one, is of, one of his last essays is titled Interpretations Interpreted for Grounding of History in Shakespearean Criticism. I just picked up a few words from this essay. And these words are decentered, ideological construct, social formation, history as text. If we see, we can see, for example, uh, we can see Christopher Norris here. We can see Terry Eagleton here. That means uh, if we see this, because uh, the word society has been replaced by social formation in theory. And when we say history as text, basically we are talking about new historicist method where we talk about uh, textuality of history and historicity of text. Textuality of history and historicity of text. So, there we see, for example, Makbul Sahab actually, when he's talking about these interpretations, he has kept abreast of all possible theories which were happening. In fact, uh, uh, he edited two very important books for Orion Blackson. Orion Blackson brought out uh, a drama classic series. And this is a book actually by Mahbul Saab. And it is a very interesting book in the sense that it presents Ham the text of Hamlet, but it has a very comprehensive introduction of 50 pages. Comprehensive introduction of 50 pages. And I'll just give you just two, three lines 
how his notes actually are so valuable when he talks about uh, some words also there is one very famous soliloquy in hamlet to be or not to be to be or not to be everyone who has studied shakespeare knows this when mabul sahab uh, writes a note about this soliloquy he writes perhaps and i am reading his words perhaps no other group of six monosyllables has been subjected to as varied interpretations as these at the opening of hamlet soliloquy the most representative views are one should i continue to live or commit suicide that is ac bradley another view whether there will be life after death or not johnson is my present project of active resistance against wrong to be or not to be dowden hamlet is not debating the question of existence and non existent b refers to being essence should man conform to his true essence this is prosser Jenkins is closer to truth in thinking that in the soliloquy as a whole, Hamlet's question concerns a relative evaluation of life and death. So that means in this brief note, actually, he has encapsulated the opinions of six different critics in this brief note. He also edited Tempest, and Tempest again it is for uh, Orient Black Swan drama classic series, two very important texts. there is another book by him edward dowden's shakespeare criticism so i'll see that uh, when i read for example maqbul sahab asloop sahab usmani sahab i do not see actually scholars of that caliber easily and i'll say that uh, these are scholars actually who have instilled in generations of student love of literature today we talk about today i am and i'm uh, saying this with uh, in uh, with full conviction it is perfectly possible for a person not to have read any play of shakespeare and still teach shakespeare it is possible for a person not to have read a novelist and still teach a novelist and the reason is very simple there are lots of videos you ask a student to see those videos there are lots of articles you give a student those articles you engage them so the word engage which is often used by university administrators also are you engaging these classes it's a very bad word so here we see that uh, uh, these are actually scholars who taught generations of student the virtue of close reading loving the text and of course loving literature i'll say that uh, and one more thing i must mention that maqbul sahab actually acknowledges the debt of stanley wells in this book stanley wells was a very famous editor shakespeare editor very famous scholar and at, when maqbul sahab was at shakespeare institute in england he worked with stanley wells stanley wells was a senior fellow there and one last thing uh, when actually maqbul sahab actually Uh, i remember some of those conversations also at that time i read uh, stephen greenblatt's biography of shakespeare and i asked maqbul sahab uh, which is the best biography on shakespeare and maqbul sahab uh, mentioned samuel shonborn's biography of shakespeare a compact documentary life in fact after his death i picked up uh, two three books from his table of course uh, his wife was very gracious to permit me to take those books and one book was this and of course there are there were lots of other books also and his shelf actually contained very valuable books all complete works of shakespeare shakespeare criticism and the good thing is that my shelf also contains many of those books but the difference between me and mahul sahib is that he had read those books also i have seen seen those books So thank you very much, Rajesh sir. I think uh, uh, this should be enough. Thank you. If you think that this should be enough, although you know it was so engaging that you know you could have continued for long, but let's say uh, here Anish sir for the concluding remarks, and after that we can come back to question and answer or comment session. Thank you, Anish sir. Ah, uh, thanks, Rajesh sir. <clears throat> Uh, Asim Sahib, let me first tell you and the audience that I have not been a student of Aligarh Muslim University. 
uh, surely a disadvantage for me as well as those who have not been there and have not known the traditions that it has placed before us and many of us have already learned from there in spite of not being there. Uh, one has known what has happened in Aligarh as far as Shakespeare studies is concerned, especially with reference to uh, uh, Stu Sari Sam, uh, whom I have had the pleasure of meeting on a number of occasions. Actually, he was one of the experts when I was uh, appointed in Jamia as a lecturer. And I have also had the opportunity of meeting Makbul Sahab in the Department of English and speaking to him at length. And one person whom you haven't mentioned, whom I regard very highly, is Vakar Sahab. All these persons that you refer to are the persons who have really read Shakespeare, understood Shakespeare, and to use within quotes, engaged with Shakespeare, that word that you were disparaging, people are using it these days. Um, uh, of course, as I said, that, are, that is a disadvantage. I have not been there. But wherever you are in the Indian universities, you, of course, are studying Shakespeare in one way or the other. The difference is that how do you study Shakespeare and how did you study Shakespeare earlier? So uh, I started and I got my uh, BA honors degree in 1968. And uh, I can tell you from then onwards what has happened with Shakespeare. That is from the late 60s to now, say about 60 years, 50 years plus, what has happened to Shakespeare? Where does Shakespeare stand today? Has something happened to Shakespeare studies since then? Has something happened to Shakespeare research since then? What is the interest of students in Shakespeare today? Do we have teachers of Shakespeare today? Do you understand the language of Shakespeare today? Do we uh, take uh, or, we, did, or do we discard A.C. Bradley altogether? No one talks of A.C. Bradley. I'm happy that you mentioned that. I'm raising these questions because uh, when we were students, we were asked to first start with A.C. Bradley's four lectures. And those lectures were, you know, on Hamlet and Othello, King Lear and Macbeth. That was our first introduction in the class that is B honors second year and third year classes. That is how we started. I wonder if that happens today. It doesn't. Because I stopped teaching a few years ago when I retired from the Department of English at Jamia. So I can tell you that uh, one hasn't heard of A.C. Bradley now. One doesn't hear of him. Even those who teach Shakespeare today don't refer to A.C. Bradley at all. But A.C. Bradley is a very important person to, to I'm sorry, to, to, to use the word again, engage with. Uh, uh, anyone who wants to study Shakespeare, <clears throat> especially in our times, will have to start from A.C. Bradley and then pass on to other critics that you have named. Uh, Wilson Knight, for example, and then after that, new historicists, the feminists and the Marxists and all that that we have mentioned. So Shakespeare from age to age has uh, come to us in different ways. It has been uh, a very challenging kind of an affair to engage with Shakespeare, to study Shakespeare, to, to enter into a kind of a research with Shakespeare. So the place of Shakespeare, I think Shakespeare has uh, been displaced in a manner, in a way. In the 70s and 80s, the English literary studies in the Indian universities, we had a certain track and in which uh, we started studying from Chaucer onwards and came down to post Eliot era and came down to say about uh, uh, the poetry and the fiction, uh, say 60, up to 60s, you could say, 50s and 60s, that's all. But now you study further and you come to the contemporary times as well. So what happened that with the advent of new studies, with the advent of new disciplines in the mm, say 80s onwards, uh, the whole syllabi all over the country got revised. And slowly and slowly you could see, and we have all seen Shakespeare receding in the background. Because when we revised our syllabus every five years in the Department of English, everywhere in the country, and I have been a part of this revision in many of the universities, apart from my own, and I have seen Shakespeare going into the background uh, year after year because there was so much to accommodate. And this was all because of the post-colonial literatures coming into focus. Everyone got interested in post-colonial literature. Uh, Asim Sahib, you would remember, you also have been a student of American literature and ASRC in Hyderabad, which doesn't stand any, exist any longer. That was the place where people used to go and meet. And many of the research scholars made their life friends there. 
you would be aware of many. My own students who went there on fellowships ultimately came back with their wives. Wonderful to <laughs> experience to be at ASRC. So what I'm trying to say that American literature took over in the 70s, 80s onwards, post-colonial, then translation, then comparative studies. So in this whole mela of the academic mela that has happened after the 80s, where does Shakespeare stand today? Uh, it's a very difficult question to answer where does Shakespeare stand today. Shakespeare is a passion, and you very rightly mentioned, and I also believe that uh, uh, what has happened with the advent of theory today, that we have uh, stopped reading a text and enjoying a text, we are more engaged with reading the theory. I'm not against theory at all. Please don't mistake me, any of my listeners here. Theory is very important to, 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 to study and to be able, I, I often asked some of my colleagues who were very theory-oriented colleagues whom I respect a lot, uh, how do you understand a particular literary text with reference to a theory? And some of my colleagues told me that theory is not a kind of a, a material with which you can engage with a text or read a text. Theory is something different. Well, that's a debatable question, whether theory helps us understand a literary text or not. But the basic problem, the basic issue that remains with us, that with the passage of time, we stopped reading much of the text. And you made a very important point, Asim sir, when you said that you teach a text without reading that and some other related text. Those were the days when we studied, suppose, for example, if we were to study one Shakespeare play, that is Macbeth, we also were compulsorily compelled to read three more of the tragedies. So if a Julius Caesar was taught in the B on not only B on as general English classes of, of the universities in the country, Julius Caesar was a very popular option. So they were also used, asked to use historical plays of Shakespeare. And Tempest was a very tall order, which even in the MA we couldn't very well follow. So Tempest was a difficult order and very difficult to understand. And one doesn't know one ever understood that properly. So Shakespeare did problem, pose problems for us, and it still does pose problems. But the more important and alarming question is that where does Shakespeare stand today? Do we have the real scholars who can engage with Shakespeare and who can really <clears throat> try and read them on their own to be able to impart their knowledge with the students? That is a very difficult question to answer today because for able uh, to be able to understand Shakespeare, one has to first engage with the language that this person is trying to use, which is very difficult to understand. But let me also assure all those, the younger especially, the students who are here, that if you start reading Shakespeare, even without understanding the language that this man is using, after reading two to three plays, I assure you that you will start enjoying that language and you will be able to understand. This is my personal experience. Macbeth was prescribed to us in the BA. And I started reading other plays because in our days, if you were reading one Jane Austen novel, Pride and Prejudice, my teacher said that you have to read four more and then come to the class. Those were diff different days altogether. So I started with Macbeth, but read all those the tragedies to be able to understand. So if you study Shakespeare three to four and five plays and you go forward like that, you will be able to understand the language itself very well. This I can assure the younger students who are here in the audience and the teachers who are there maybe who are teaching Shakespeare. So Shakespeare trains you with his own language. You don't need another teacher. Of course, you need academically. Theoretically, you need that language and you need to understand the tools that you need to have your hand to be able to understand Shakespeare. Shakespeare starts communicating with you. And you start appreciating that author very well. Just as in a from different, very different context, I'm using this. Eliot says that great poetry communicates before it is understood. Similarly, Shakespeare's plays starts communicating to you before it is understood. So you are able to understand the histories and the tragedies and other plays, the comedies and the fantasies, etc. Especially I'm referring to Tempest. So when you take all those things to consideration, you'll be able to receive Shakespeare well. That brings us to the question of reception of Shakespeare. So the question of reception, the reception of Shakespeare has changed considerably. It has changed considerably, no doubt about that. But Shakespeare has come to us in our age in different ways. I think somebody very rightly mentioned that there are very many ways of teaching Shakespeare today. We are in an age of internet. We can go to internet and get Shakespeare. You can have Dylan Thomas reading Shakespeare and you understand Shakespeare through that. In our days, those were, these facilities were not available. Even books on Shakespeare were mostly issued from the libraries and the pages that you really needed were already torn off by some of the students who had, so there were no photocopiers available at that point of time. 
there were very few uh, copies of the books available at that point of time so only your teachers were in a position to tell you to teach you and to be able to, to, be able to train you so that you can uh, take up uh, your affair with shakespeare and carry it forward even after your student days when you stop reading shakespeare and you you start specializing or teaching some other you start forgetting shakespeare again you don't go back to shakespeare but shakespeare remains a part and parcel of your canon unshakable canon and in the syllabus revision committees that I have attended in different universities that I have heard a voice quite coming often that Chaucer must be driven out now and it has already been driven out uh, from many universities long before Chaucer Langland was driven out and Gower was driven out they were, because it was very difficult to teach Gower and Langland then Shakespeare now comes uh, these days, uh, there is a voice from many universities where I go and I have been that uh, they question the existence of Shakespeare in the syllabi because there is so much to teach and we don't have a space for that. This is Lyle me. Let, let us call it Lyle me. Your inability to understand the value because there is such a great tradition. So if you are reading the individual talents of the later generations of the university and later, how can you sh forget Shakespeare? So this change in the pedagogy, we were talking of pedagogy, this change in pedagogy has really mattered a lot. And because of that, a taste for that Shakespearean study, Shakespeare, the plays of Shakespeare, the taste has diminished, of course, but it cannot really <clears throat> be set aside. Shakespeare is a part of the canon, is there to be a part of the canon for all times. So this uh, problem of reception, the problem of uh, teaching Shakespeare, the problem of, uh, say, reaching out to the folios. Many of the students are not aware of the folios today. And I'm sorry to say that many of those who teach Shakespeare are not aware of the folios. You mentioned very rightly, you mentioned folios, one, two, three, and, and that went on. So the challenges of Shakespeare studies are there. But uh, this is something which you cannot set aside. And of course, uh, to, to to bring the matter to my, uh, because there are questions and answers, I understand. Um, very clearly, very clearly, your department at AMU has played a very distinct role if you take the consider into consideration the other departments of the country. In Delhi University, there has been, because Hamlet studies, the, that, uh, that journal has been there for a long time. Shakespeare libraries are there, that has been there for a the long time. And some of the very distinguished teachers from the University of Delhi and, and other places are there who are remembered for, from Allahabad, for example, from Aligarh, from Delhi University, from the University of Madras in those days. The places which I have visited and which I have known and some of the senior of my colleagues who, whom I have met and I had the opportunity of meeting and interacting, engaging with them. So, of course, that generation. But the new generation that is there will have to understand to be able to get back to the, the canon. The canon cannot be. Of course, canon gets revised quite often. New canons um, come up, but they cannot come up at the cost of the old canon. The history of literature is not taught in many universities. I have been a great devotee and a great votary of teaching of history of literature. In many of the universities, history of literature is not taught. And if that is not taught, if Shakespeare is not taught, if the canon is not taught, if the chronology is not taught, if the student is not able to relate a text with an age automatically. In our days, and I'm going to finish on this, in our days, in the MA paper, the first question was an unseen text and in which you were compulsorily asked to relate it to which text, to which age does this text come from and you have to write a paragraph on that. And this was something, this was the first question, a compulsory question, one full passage of a page, maybe two page, passages um, spread over a page in the question paper. You had to tell possibly 18th century prose or 19th or 20th. Similarly, some poems were there and we had to tell. So to be able to understand the canon and to relate it with the kind of language and the revision that is happening. Lots of questions are there. I understand we can go on further as these are. If uh, I am, there must be people who would react to these responses to these questions that we have raised. Asim Sahib has raised in some of my observations that I have made, and some of the faculty members. I I can see Monira is there, and both the Moniras are here, and Nazia Hassan is here, and Rashid is here. So we can also engage with that. What's happening yeah, so, today? Yeah, in that question and answer session, maybe, you know, comments. Thank you so much, Aziza. Thank you, Asim Sahib, for such a wonderful expose. Thank you so much for all this uh, engagement. And we <laughs> really just, just, just one line, just one line. Oh, yes. uh, Anisa, Anisa mentioned Vakhar Sahib. I just wanted to tell Anisa, Vakhar Sahib had something common with uh, Tolstoy. 
both uh, did not develop any love for shakespeare ha 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 but we talked so for about shakespeare so yeah your har sahab was an unparalleled scholar unparalleled yeah, yeah. When so you, I used to go to Aligarh, and Akbar Sahab was yeah. one of the persons with whom yeah. one talked about Shakespeare. When so he came he to Jansen, he always in the question and answer session. Yeah, yeah. fiction, so, fiction was his forte. Okay, so with this announcement for the coming Saturday, uh, we are going to talk on gender education and marginality, the realities of Muslim girls' education in India. Professor Satyendra Pal Kaur from University of Punjab, Chandigarh, is going to speak on the topic. So over to Dr. Professor uh, Rafat Hussain for question and answer session. Uh, Rafat, thank you very much for making me professor. I know <laughs> there are three professors now, so you are making me professor as well. Thank you, <laughs> although I am not a professor. So thank you all three professor, Professor Asim Siddiqui, Professor Munira, and Professor uh, Rahman. It was a wonderful session. and uh, the session is open for question and answer so you can raise your digital hand or put your request in the chat i will keep uh, monitoring both of them uh, so let's see in chat uh, the the two chat came in right now and uh, to raise a digital hand is much easier so please go at yes sayyad amir sa the session is open now amir bhai one second let me turn on the yeah, yeah. Okay. i've turned it on already yeah. okay thank you thank you amir bhai can you unmute okay. thank you i can't um start the video so oh, okay reason. okay one second yeah uh, all right you can start the video also thank you still i'm sorry but i cannot carry on without the video um, yeah yeah you can turn it on now uh, I... i'm trying but it doesn't seem to cooperate um oh all right um uh, okay thank you um, it's a pleasure listening to these scholarly presentations i was a student in the late 50s at aligarh and although i was a science student i was we were required to have uh, some english Uh, classes and um, so i was taught um, um by salamatullah sahab merchant of venice and of course he couldn't really cover the whole of it but um, portions he taught was very very informative we enjoyed it and mahmud sahab uh, those is what had the department and for some people called him qari mahmud because he used to speak english or pronounce english and is a special characteristic way so he was known as kari mehmood and aslub ansari sahab was a young man he was just starting with this uh, he taught some english uh, to me also and um, but he was nowhere know what we emerged afterwards evolved into such a authority english critique and literature um i have uh, one question also the since it's such a scholarly gathering Uh, the, some of the questions persist about uh, Shakespeare, whether the plays written by him were in fact written by him. Some people have speculated it was Earl of Oxford who actually was the author, because uh, Merchant of Venice and others um, had such a um, need for somebody who to have knowledge of Europe, Italy especially. and um, of those days which as far as we know shakespeare never left england um and Earl of oxford uh, he spent a lot of time in italy and in those days uh, italy was for people who were uh, affluent in england used to go there because it was supposed to be salubrious climate and shelly and brown died there and keith just... so um if you um, have any ideas whether what you think uh, yes. Uh, whether you subscribe to that thought that Shakespeare indeed was the author, or uh, somebody else. Thank you. Uh, it's a very interesting question. First of all, uh, uh, it is good to know that Salama Sahab also used to teach Shakespeare. I never knew this, so I, I, I am learning from you. Anyway, uh, this is a very interesting question, actually. 
and especially this question has been uh, raised by number of people so much so that uh, the question who wrote shakespeare who wrote shakespeare was uh, also the subject of this book by james shapiro and actually uh, i found this book very interesting and i found it on professor maqbul hasan khan's table i took it from there and i read this book two times uh at different times actually there were different candidates it was said that uh, uh, bacon wrote shakespeare that means francis bacon francis bacon was uh, a very important person in the court and uh, he was very well educated also widely traveled also so it was believed that uh, somebody actually uh, like shakespeare who came from a very ordinary family from a village how could he know those distant lands how could he know royalty that well so maybe bacon was the candidate that was uh, one candidate and then at other times christopher marlowe was advanced as uh, somebody who wrote shakespeare and you as you rightly mentioned uh, earl of oxford also so that means and there are lots of important people also somebody like mark twain uh, did not believe that shakespeare wrote shakespeare and that's why in 18th century i made a reference to many of those forgeries also his actually inter interesting thing is that the name of that uh, person who committed forgery was oxford and he got papers from very old papers papers which had become almost yellow and he wrote shakespeare's text and then he said that this is one play which was written by shakespeare and he said that these are some papers which uh, i found there and actually all those things appeared so dramatic as to appear unbelievable so it was in 18th century but later those forgeries were also detected and so much so that uh, in 20th century there was also a trial actually uh, court trial and there were people who were uh, on the side of uh, others and those who believed that shakespeare actually wrote shakespeare so that means this was a very important and this question has also been raised sometimes uh, uh, in a very light hearted manner in some detective novels also so that means uh, and of course now since you have the internet and there are uh, say all kinds of blogs so this question actually has been revived in some ways but serious shakespeare scholars actually don't uh, debate this question anymore and i would mention one very important name and uh, i was also interested in this question and i asked maqbul sahab uh, so he uh, and of course uh, when bacon is advanced as a candidate interesting thing is that uh, one american lady her name was also delia bacon she raised this issue that it was bacon who wrote uh, shakespeare and there is a whole book written by samuel chalmon and that book is titled shakespeare's lives which actually uh, different people who have uh, written biographies of shakespeare that is the book and then um, one actually reason why this question is asked is that there are about some 15 years in shakespeare's life which are almost dark years that means from from uh, 16 from uh, 1580 to say early 90s and nobody knew actually what happened so much so that somebody like stephen greenblatt stephen greenblatt is a very big name very big name he is uh, a pioneer of new historicism a very important critic and stephen stephen greenblatt wrote a biography of shakespeare and one very interesting thing is that uh, when there are so many biographies already there what was the need for one more biography so one A scholar of Shakespeare, Gary Taylor, wrote a review of that biography, and uh, he wrote a very interesting sentence. It says that uh, Stephen Greenblatt uh, has written this biography of Shakespeare, and he says that this is his love letter to Shakespeare, and love letters are never known for their objectivity. That was uh, his remark. So the thing is that at many places Stephen Greenblatt also writes sentences like this: Shakespeare would have done this. Shakespeare would have been present here. That there is a there was a performance in Stratford uh, and a kind of fair. Everyone was present there, and maybe Shakespeare's father took Shakespeare on his shoulders, and Shakespeare saw that, and he took those influences. 
the reason is that because there are so many years in Shakespeare's life where nothing is known. And there is also one view that uh, England became Protestant at that time. And many people actually who were Catholics or who were closet Catholic, they were hunted out. They were, in fact, driven out. They were killed also. And sometimes their heads were actually hanged also. So it was believed that maybe it was a great fear that Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare's family was Catholic, so Shakespeare disappeared from the scene. But all said and done, is, uh, Samuel Sean Vaughan has written a biography of uh, Shakespeare. That biography is titled uh, A Compact Documentary Life. That means he has tried to talk about different incidents in Shakespeare's life, giving evidence. And thanks to the work of a number of scholars, actually, in different fields who have uh, come out with new evidences, now this question is as good as settled. Because there was a man uh, who had a kind of genius to lead different lives. Otherwise, the question was that somebody who is uh, selling malt, somebody who is suing his sweater, somebody who is fighting his neighbors over trifles, how could that person write those great plays? But thing is that uh, person who appears petty also in his dealings was also a genius. And of course, uh, so there are there are many lives in that one life. So this question is as good as settled now. Thank okay. you so much. So before I invite uh, other people, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, Dr. Tazin Bey, uh, daughter of uh, the Mahbul Sa, she is uh, she she is on the, the in the audience, and she lives here in the U.S. in the New York area, and she had a comment also <laughs> for you guys. Okay, the next person is uh, Iltafat. Iltafat bhai? Oh, he's gone. Okay. No, he's not gone. But he... Anyway, uh, move it to another person. Uh, so, if he's here, then let's I don't see. know why he's not. Here. I ask him to unmute. Maybe he has the same problem. No, no, there is no problem. Anybody, everybody can. Okay, oh. so we'll come back to him. Nazir Saab. Oh. Okay. Nazir Saab, uh, unmute yourself. Um... Nazir Saab? People are. Saab? Yes, 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 yes. He, he is here. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I have uh, two brief questions for the distinguished professors, Professor Siddiqui Saab, Anisur Rahman Saab, and, and uh, Munira Sahaba. One has to do with the thematic choice in Shakespeare's plays. And the other one has to do with the historical context. The convulsions in human affairs first manifest themselves as storms in the human breast. And the greatness of Shakespeare is that he focused on those storms, what goes on in the human heart, rather than on the affairs of men, although he drew from the second to focus on the first. Pride and passion, jealousy, compassion, domination, submission, intrigue, fidelity, played out on an existential paradigm of human free will. Uh, that's the key, seems to me, to be his, to his greatness, along with that for instance, of Rumi. The second one, the times of Shakespeare were times of enormous transformations in global history, the period of uh, Elizabeth I, when England transformed itself from a bunch of um, uh, pirates to global traders. It was the time of the Spanish Armada, for instance, the Battle of Three Kings in Morocco, the implosion of uh, the uh, Songhai Empire, and the gathering in momentum of the Atlantic slave trade, the founding of the East India Company. 
For instance, in the Merchant of Venice, we see, for instance, not just Portia and Shylock. We have uh, references to the Prince of Morocco, the Prince of Aragon, and uh, so many other different characters. So to what extent were the times normative or formative in Shakespeare's writings? If you please. Thank you, sir. And it's up. आप अनिश सर अपने को अनम्यूट कर ले अनम्यूट करें सॉरी आई डिडंट नो आई जस्ट वांडरिंग हाउ वेल नजीर साहब इज सो वेल रेड ही हैज ऑलरेडी स्पोकन टू अस इन सच अ डिटेल्ड वे ऑफ हाउ शेक्सपियर शुड बी टेकन एंड ही कुड रिलेट सम ऑफ द एसेंशियल ह्यूमन पैशंस दैट शेक्सपियर वाज ट्राइंग टू राइट अबाउट एंड दीस आर द एसेंशियल ह्यूमन पैशंस दैट कीप अस गोइंग एंड थ्रू जनरेशंस एंड एजेस दैट हैज बीन द सब्जेक्ट ऑफ मेजर राइटर्स इकोनॉमिकल राइटर्स ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड but as him sir you will be able to i think uh, deliberate further upon what the sir has said no he has already talked about this i'll just uh, add a few things now if you see for example the settings of shakespeare's plays then uh, they are set in denmark they are set in vienna they are set in that means uh, they are set in all other places mm -hmm. that means uh, the contemporary england is not present that means uh, if shakespeare wants to talk about contemporary england then of course he has to set his play in vienna he has to set his play in the other places so and of course it can be understandable also because uh, this was a period of monarchy extreme authority was uh, there in the figure of the king or of course the queen so that means uh, there were such strict laws just give you one example uh, for example there was a vagabond vagabond law so if somebody was just found uh, roaming on the road that person could be arrested if somebody was visiting a new city and he could not tell why then he could be arrested and of course if you see many sports also games also of that period then uh, uh, you see at most kind of cruelty about those games and of course you also see how people who held catholic beliefs how they were hunted down how they were just killed and uh, there was also a particular law for example which was passed in england i think it was in uh, uh, that officially actually all jews were uh, in fact uh, required to leave england and i think in th uh, 1292 or something uh, so thing is that when shakespeare was writing merchant of venice for example when he was writing merchant of venice and at that time uh, uh, marlo as you pointed out at marlo had already written jew of malta so shakespeare was taking an issue with uh, marlo also in that that means uh, i can probably outdo you but there are other uh, famous trials also uh, there was one very famous trial also and it is said that macbeth pr probably was the result of that so here you can say that uh, maybe shakespeare's own life or the times or uh, possibly important uh, events of his time they all somehow were present in shakespeare's plays but uh, they are so but they disappear behind the dramatic techniques actually that uh, you cannot say that this is something which actually happened and shakespeare has reproduced that thing because uh, shakespeare's is essentially a kind of dramatic art and he has those dramatic characters also and in dramatic art and i am actually reminded of uh, somebody like james joyce uh, where uh, uh, he borrows that idea from thomas aquinas that there can be three different kinds of art lyrical art epical art and dramatic art in the lyrical art the artist is very much present in the epical art half present but in the dramatic art the artist is refined out of existence that means his uh, existence you cannot just uh, detect so you rightly pointed out those emotion those other things uh, uh, and uh, those references they all are present in shakespeare and of course but uh, through his dramatic art i also wanted to add one uh, other perspective also that today for example uh, 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 we are reading shakespeare not only the text but also we are trying to 
see performances of Shakespeare because uh, he is told his historical method, his method of uh, reading Shakespeare through the history of stage. Now you also see Shakespeare through his adaptations and you see that every performance of a Shakespeare's play is also a kind of interpretation. If you see, for example, a film like, uh, and I'll, I'll give you just uh, two references. In 1948 or 49, uh, Lawrence Olivier made uh, Hamlet. And the very first line of that uh, on, the, on the screen was, this is a play, this is a play about a person who thought who thought too much. That means the, that was the collision idea that it's a tragedy of reflection, somebody who is thinking uh, a lot and uh, because of thinking, he's not able to act. So that interpretation is taken up by Lawrence Olivier. But if you see, for example, somebody like Kishore Sahu, who made Hamlet in 1954, if you today, if today, for example, you see Hamlet made by Kishore Sahu in 1954, uh, you'll say that, oh, Hamlet uh, was quoting Ghalib, Hamlet was quoting Dach. That means there, uh, that kind of high-flown English is replaced by very flowery Urdu. And there actually, the reason is that uh, 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 Kishore Sahu is presented Hamlet through a history of Parsi theatre. And actually, when you see, for example, early history of uh, Indian films, uh, you see that the first... Uh, one very important film was Khune Nahak, which was based on Hamlet. Then Khune Nahak was made again. It was again based on Hamlet. When it was turned into a talkie, it was based on Hamlet. And then Kishore Sahu made Hamlet in 1954. So you see that there are uh, different conventions also through which we see Shakespeare. And today we, in the department, we have a paper, Shakespeare in Performance. My colleague, Professor Samina Khan, teaches that paper with a lot of interest. So there she attends to Shakespeare's performance, for example how Shakespeare has been adopted in films, how Shakespeare uh, has been presented on the stage, how uh, you see different interpretation, interpretations of Shakespeare when he's performed on the stage. Because Shakespeare's plays were not simply meant to be read, they were also meant to be performed. And of course, when Shakespeare was writing, he was writing for the stage. Thank you. Aisha Munira Rashid, please. Iltafat sahab, if you are interested to ask the question, please raise your digital hand. I don't want to put you on the spot. And one, one, just one add, I'll just add. I mean, actually, I'm thinking of one interesting incident. My friend Saeed Alam, he directed uh, a play, Maulana Azad. And in that play, actually, Tom Walter was playing Maulana Azad. And that was a marvelous performance. Later, when the play actually ended, everybody started asking Tom, uh, Tom Walter questions about Maulana Azad. He said, I am a, I'm simply an actor. I am not a Maulana Azad expert. So <laughs> I was talking about actually uh, Shakespeare at Aligarh, but I ended up answering questions on Shakespeare. So I am not a Shakespeare scholar. <laughs> Thank you. Munira yeah. Sahiba, please. But your answers are very satisfactory, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> my question is related with, I have two things and uh, uh, I would like uh, the opinion of the expert, Professor Asim Siddiqui and uh, uh, Professor Anis uh, to uh, tell me, enlighten me on these two issues. Number one is associated with the word that uh, Professor Asim Siddiqui used regarding Todorov's Criticism, a projection, but I'm not using the word projection here in that sense. Shakespeare created characters such as uh, Othello, who were oppressive towards their wives so much so they, that he killed his wife without uh, discussing what actually happened between, what was there between her and uh, Keshu. The other one, the white person. So was it some kind of veiled projection or can as a reader of Shakespeare we read this uh, character Othello as some kind of projection of um, projection of the white race on the on a character belonging uh, to a dark race uh, since we know that Queen Elizabeth's father Henry VIII was known to be a wife killer and her mother herself was killed just after her birth, two years after her birth. Anne Boleyn was killed by 
Henry the fifth and he kept killing wives so much so that no women were ready to marry him later. This one question was this some kind of projection or was it some kind of veiled uh, representation of this kind of a character but he did it uh, he he somehow created a character who is dark who is a moor Othello and the other ca uh, question is uh, related with a paradox that uh, Professor Asim Siddiqui hinted on and uh, Radha Anisar in fact discussed that is uh, the question of the vernacular protestantism that was promoted by uh, Elizabeth's uh, father, Henry the Eighth, uh, because he wanted to marry one more than one wife. That was his personal reason. But the point was that he had to take permission from um, from the uh, I mean from from the Pope. So he wanted to have his own church. That's why the language English also was promoted more, much more than it could have happened earlier. So Shakespeare, writers like Shakespeare, many other writers like Shakespeare flourished and England had its, uh, had to have its own identity, a linguistic identity, its own vernacular developing as um, an important uh, part of its uh, national identity. So English that way became more respectable as a vernacular. So here is a paradox uh, because we study English. So what happens is that we do it mostly at the cost of our vernacular and because India is a di uh, linguistically diverse country. So we have too many vernaculars. So people often say that uh, students don't understand English and uh, they don't understand Shakespeare far from knowing a simple English that we use um, on a daily basis. It's very difficult for them to understand Shakespeare, such an such a dated writer. So here, I would like to have your opinion. Shakespeare pedagogy becomes quite a tough job for teachers like us when reading habits are on the decline, and uh, we, uh, students uh, refuse to read more than five pages, maybe even one page. So uh, it it may become longer, but I I know that I uh, my esteemed colleagues and teachers have got my, have understood me. So thank you so much. Right. Okay. Uh, Aisha has already answered uh, her question. Uh, the first question, uh, she talked with reference to Othello. Actually, I'm not familiar with those details which you mentioned, but uh, I understand the spirit of the question. And if you permit me, I can answer this question with reference to Hamlet. Uh, for example, you, you mentioned, uh, say, a particular kind of uh, personal thing and how that personal thing is projected into the play. Okay, quite possible. You see, Freud actually built up his whole theory of Oedipus complex. And uh, at that time, actually, Freud was greatly worried about the dates of some events. So, for example, when did Shakespeare's father die? Or when did Shakespeare's son Hamnet die? If, for example, uh, one uh, knows Hamnet, so was Shakespeare projecting his uh, grief of having lost his son into Hamlet? Or was Shakespeare projecting loss of his father into Hamlet? These are actually questions, and but these questions are debated, but never settled. So maybe the same thing uh, can be said about uh, your question about Hamlet. But the second question, I think I can be more specific about that. Uh, say English, how it developed and how, for example, it developed from Shakespeare's time. You see, when Shakespeare was writing, uh, at that time, uh, if you see Shakespeare has himself written the spelling of his name in different ways. So that means the standardization of English had not taken place. And one very important development in the standardization of English was the establishment of printing press uh, in the uh, 15th century. When printing press actually started, you needed 
say one particular standard and it so happened that uh, mr caxton who actually who started the printing press he himself was a very well read person so what he did was he started using a particular spelling in all the drafts in all those things which he was printing in all those books he was printing now imagine a situation before him if for example i have to copy a, a text five times chances are that i'll commit some mistakes each time i copy with my hand imagine 50 persons copying a text they will commit different kinds of mistake so the spelling was in a complete uh, in a state of complete chaos so printing press actually meant standardization of spelling and that's why you see that uh, more than anything else of course printing press was responsible just as in our own time for example computers are greatly responsible for many changes in english language so at that time that technology was no less revolutionary so i think the uh, i hope this answers your question partly with relation to the second question that aisha raised i just had to add one sentence that languages don't grow um, say independently there is an element of polyvalency in every language uh, it doesn't grow unilaterally it grows in conversation with other languages and it is not only of english but of all the languages look at the very case of urdu itself the way it developed from the 16th century onwards or go back to amir khosrow from there onwards you will see that there is a shift in the 15th century it comes in the hands of qali qutub shah then goes to wali and then comes to mir and then you can see how it well developed so no language is independent and and stands on its own there are pressures of other languages or dialects around this is a court video culturally speaking so if you take that into consideration you will be able to understand shakespeare in the same context that no language is is uh, or does grow unilaterally but the element of polyvalency is that which contributes towards now the question that is more important which you are engaging with is that how do you as a scholar or a faculty member teach this when this language poses a question of its uh, before the student and before the teacher as an, my own experience is that the more you read shakespeare even without understanding in the very first go you acclimatize with shakespeare you try and you you start understanding him bit by bit and then you engage with others as well at the same time like for example marvel which comes very close to that and then shakespeare trains you in that particular language with which you are engaging and finally you come to understand and appreciate shakespeare after a few readings of that along with your teacher so polyvalency of that language is the idea that i was trying to present that languages don't grow unilaterally thank you professor rahman uh, razi bhai i don't see any more questions so back to Na you nazia nazia raised uh, her hand i think nazia is here nazia hasan yeah please. just just nazia hasan please Nazia, mm. hello. Yeah, I asked to unmute her. Maybe she can now. Go ahead, Nazia. Please try and. Hello, oh, hello. Assalamualaikum. Good evening. Uh, 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 many congratulations to Rafat Saab and Razi Saab for organizing this lecture. and lectures are successful that is marked by the fact that the lectures never come to an end at the given time it goes on and people keep talking and asking questions um because the lecture was in a chronicle mode and it talked about the scholars and the teachers who have been teaching shakespeare at aligarh muslim university uh, i would have loved to hear about two other teachers Uh, of women's college uh, professor Ken khwaja kaniz ahmed and professor iffat ara and they were almost like uh, because there was lot of comparison between shakespeare and cricket so they were almost like dravid and sachin tendulkar and uh, uh, now i saw that they are like relegated to a position where they were not mentioned so professor khwaja kaniz ahmed was a great teacher and all of us who have come from women's college and to the department of english perhaps 
we will never forget the way they used to teach. Uh, and as Anis Saab mentioned that uh, every good teacher makes the students go through A.C. Bradley and Wilson Knight. And at that time, it seemed like a torment, but we were sent to the library and we were made to study Bradley and Wilson Knight books to write notes in order to understand. So uh, this is one thing that I found missing at it. It, would have it was a very, very enriching lecture. It is always good to hear about Shakespeare. I'm also reminded of various other uh, little things, but uh, it tells me about the dedication of the teachers. Like my teachers were very concerned that the students do not use bazaar notes, right? And uh, the most uh, difficult part of doing Shakespeare in Women's College was attending to the Vaivavasi examination, which was for 10 marks. But we were horrified by the very idea of facing uh, Kaniz ma'am and Iftat ma'am because they will be asking us questions. And it was more difficult than attempting a 90 marks question paper. So, and, and I remember some of the questions like, once uh, one of my classmates was asked about the name of the play and the name of the author. And some students, in spite of all kind of uh, uh, training and insistence of the teacher that you have to avoid uh, uh, the bazaar notes, they would say that, okay, Othello was written by uh, Majumdar or somebody like this. And that, that was a hilarious uh, instance, which our teacher uh, used to mention in the classroom in order to make us understand the value of good books and reading Shakespeare uh, in the first hand instead of uh, reading with some other kind of notes. So uh, thank you for all these lovely reminders, these lovely memories. And the lecture was uh, a very enriching one. It is always very, Satisfying, very fulfilling to hear. I just add and one. An Thank you. May, uh, no, actually, uh, I'll just add. I'll, I'll just add one comment. Uh, actually, nobody is relegated, Kanizapa, for that matter. But actually, when I am discussing, actually, I am also looking at the volume of work that Mahmud Sahib has published. Volume of work that Asloop Sahib is there, right? So actually, there are any number of great teachers, right? But uh, when we talk about something uh, as important as uh, Shakespeare studies at Aligarh, then probably this is something which is very important, say publication and uh, those publications actually which are there for others also. Otherwise, uh, uh, you see, this would have been a very, very long talk because uh, of course there are lots of teachers also, and remarkable teachers and Kaniz Ma'am is certainly one of the Highness teachers, no doubt about it. Okay, thank Rafat, you. Rafat, can you ask Professor Both Prakash Saab to participate? No. Yeah, there is a Munira Muni Rawana to say something. Professor, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Okay. Um, I I just wanted to add uh, to what Anizmai was saying. Uh, my love for uh, literature for Shakespeare started in class eight. When uh, my school class tends to tempest, and that was in the evening, and it was dark, and I still remember Ariel, you know, hovering around. It was such a fantastic performance that I fell in love with Shakespeare. And to date, till date, it has continued. And I believe that even though Shakespeare has gone, you know, a backstage in our syllabuses, etc., but whatever little we teach, we're still able to instill that love in our students. I remember teaching Othello to my BA students and uh, coming towards the end, you know, at the end of the semester, by the time we came to Othello stabbing himself, we had students crying in class along with the teacher. So I think that love of Shakespeare will continue. I mean, if, if uh, we continue to teach, uh, we, we force our students to look at the text and dramatize it for them in such a manner, I think uh, Shakespeare will live with us forever. Thank you. Um, Rashid Nihal, sir. Professor Rashid Nihal.
both prakash ji yeah after that um i don't see rashi sir raj i i see someone put a chat then i ask a question rashid nayal sir is bhai yahan par yahan par razi bhai raat hone wali hai zyada just just yeah. one or two questions so ask please ask uh, razi bhai never gets tired okay prakash sir sahab. both both prakash sir thank you razi oh. sir uh, uh, for organizing this session uh, am i am i audible yes you are yes. audible but we yeah you can you can put your video uh, and, and 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 yeah okay uh, if you like uh, all right so uh, so i i was uh, i was fascinated by the uh, by the all all the information that asim saab gave us about shakespeare studies in aligarh muslim university and i was uh, also thinking about uh, the remarks made by professor anisur rahman uh, regarding uh, uh, you know shakespeare studies in our current uh, uh, sort of uh, syllabi see one of the things that we had to decide i think at some stage probably in the late 80s and early 90s certainly in uh, literature english literature departments in india was whether we wanted to continue to teach uh, english literature or literatures in english and i think uh, uh, th this was this was a very conscious choice that we made uh, hence uh, uh, you know the move away from uh, a certain kind of uh, canonical literatures uh, including shakespeare of course uh, and then also subjecting shakespeare to uh, a closer scrutiny with regard to the context in which he uh, his plays were or his works were introduced in uh, uh, in the colonies uh, if i remember correctly asim saab would have uh, more information about this shakespeare was not a hugely popular writer in the english uh, literary academy in fact uh, you know the whole idea of projecting a secular english culture uh, you know uh, sort of uh, uh, it, it 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 was important for for the colonial regime so not not so much milton but much more shakespeare and then of course the kind of uh, uh, the ways in which shakespeare was received uh, i speak of course of india you know the way the translations were done and the representations the presentations of the stage were done so there is a certain kind of history of shakespeare in india and and how he was received and how he was interpreted which is also a very interesting uh, story by itself of course this is not to deny the painstaking scholarship of uh, shakespeare scholars uh, from in fact the 19th uh, and and most part of the 20th century i mean this they did some absolutely amazing work and here i may sort of uh, concur absolutely with the uh, anis saab because you know like him i am of course uh, uh, he senior to me but uh, i also did my uh, you know my my uh, courses in shakespeare both at my ba level and my ma and in fact uh, i am here i recall some of my teachers at delhi university uh, who were very instrumental in generating this interest uh professor maitli call uh whom with whom i did uh, a couple of courses on shakespeare in my mphil but before that professor desai uh who uh, some of you may remember he uh, looked after the the hamlet studies journal for for a very long time so uh, and 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 these were very very inspiring teachers and they kindled our interest but as i said by the mid, by the mid 80s or late 80s uh you know uh, shakespeare was being received in a very very different kind of context so so thank you thank you uh, professors asim siddiqui and uh, professor anis rahman for for those very very interesting observations thank you thank you prakash saab uh, last call for rashid nayal saab yes uh, assalam alaikum can you hear me hello yes 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 uh, it was a very interesting exposition by professor asim saab and a very interesting equally interesting interaction that has generated lot of new uh, things on shakespeare what what exactly was my concern was that given that we have a lot of linguistic diversity and lot of 
people coming from different uh, rural uh, areas where they want to learn about Shakespeare. Uh, I'm, I would just like to know that what kind of methodological diversity would you like to recommend for teaching our Shakespeare where <coughs> Shakespeare is also taught in rural areas and sometimes in Bhojpuri language also and people try to appreciate Shakespeare there also, right? So that has always uh, prompted me to see that uh, Shakespeare, they read twice, thrice, first in their Bhojpuri, then second in Hindi, then third in English. And then they started looking up for some courses in Shakespeare. Something on that, please. Thank you. Rashid, I need six hours of sleep to answer that question. <laughs> Rashid sir, that also I, I think it is getting late. Lamb's tales from Shakespeare, with which his students have started in their schools, and uh, wonderful uh, you say you have uh, uh, broached an issue which really needs deliberation, and makes me smile because there are so many ways of approaching this person. Those are known in certain parts of the country as Shakespeare, who ultimately was a person called Shakespeare, who somehow yeah. became Shakespeare and wrote all these plays. So there are many interesting anecdotes which will open up many theses for us to appreciate what he really <laughs> was. But re reading him in Urdu, Hindi, Bhojpuri and whatnot uh, really goes to establish what a wonderful um, uh, portrayal of human emotions or divine human, say, um, uh, essential human feelings or essential human <clears throat> identifier, so to say. So how this man try to engage with all that? But your question really opens up many, many avenues to think further. Th thanks, Rashid Safo. Thank you. Thank you very much. That Thank concludes you. the um, uh, question and answer session. And uh, back to Razi Bhai. I think, I think it was a very, very engaging and long session and quite fruitful. I think uh, I'll say that if we come up like, you know, every second month or third month from English department, something. It was very well attended also. It is a good lecture where you really, you know, it's a very engaging lecture. So why not? People really learn a lot. You are reviving certain traditions. So awesome. uh, maybe <laughs> just think about it seriously, really. Think like every so, second or third month. Have, actually, a literature. Yeah, you're very right because... Uh... I did not expect this kind of a participation. I mean, it is almost. Asim Sahab and his students who really attended this. and they Yeah, very well it. attended. Yeah. So I was not really expecting more than 30, 40 would be coming here. It's, no, no, uh, almost 90, 95. It keeps it coming and hope. going. So, so, so it, and then it will be on the YouTube. So, I mean, this yeah. kind of lectures will be really very fruitful to maybe it doesn't speak so much you engage Shakespeare others or, also. It speaks about the person who was speaking about Shakespeare. <laughs> Oh, it was it was very well and uh, you know uh, we can reformat for other topics and all those but this department can do a lot of good things you know, lots of things can through this yeah things. so asim sahab i would like to not now at least your interpretation for to be or not to be what okay. is your interpretation Later on. हमेशा लास्ट में ना रफत साहब एक ऐसा सवाल पूछ देते हैं कि वहां से एक नई कहानी हो या whether it's nobler in mind to suffer or to take slings and arrows out of their courageous fortune, <laughs> that's a little big question. I mean, sir, Marke bhi chayin na to kahan jayenge wohi hai, Dalima. Asim is teaching film also, you know, in English department, right? Film, yeah. film as a subject. And he's uh, good in the movie review and sports review and all those things. I think just uh, other topics uh, on the movies, I think. You know, or but is I think the the is is the the revive it. Revive it. Revive it. If you are listening to 100 that means... Nain, it, uh, we started from Bradley. We graduated to Elsinites and Wilsonite. And finally, we came to Stephen, uh, Stephen Greenblatt. And there we stopped. After that, uh, the, the boggy has gone further. I have been left behind, but that is how the, these are the three stages I have been able to associate here. Uh, the, uh, first, Bradley, L.C. Knight, Wilson Knight, Stephen Gradnett, and after that, the Bible is going further. I got uh, I, I got a lot of uh, actually inquiries uh, from others, you know, from audience also, that why 
why we are covering so many famous poets and personalities, why we have not touched upon one of the most important figure, Tagore, in the so far. And so just keep in mind, Tagore is overdue here, really. And I, I do not know whom to whom to ask for it, but Tagore is certainly it, he needs multiple events, I believe. Tagore scholarship has grown so much. Yeah. One may discuss about that. Okay, Asim Saab, thank you so much. And I know it's kind of Asim Saab, we are Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. You get only one day off. Okay, enjoy your weekend and thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.